Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, I am Priya Natarajan. Um, I'm the current director of the Frankie program in Science and the Humanities. And I'm delighted to invite you all today for our colloquium, uh, Understanding the Nature of Inference. Uh, this has been a series, as you all know, that um, we have um, had um, since the past year. And I, may, I want to start this afternoon by first um, thanking and recognizing uh, the generosity of Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, and um, who have funded the Frankie program and many other interdisciplinary activities at Yale. Uh, I want to remind the audience that because this event is being recorded, all videos and microphones will be muted. And as per custom, uh, we request you to submit questions in the Q&A feature of the webinar. As you all know, the inference, uh, understanding the inference, nature of inference series, colloquium series, is one in which we have been looking deeply at the process of inference across disciplines with a real view to understand the utility of conceptual models, simulations, arguments um, that are particular to a discipline, but transcend and teach us something more profound about the um, notion of causation, inference, and cause and effect, as well as correlation. As you know, we've assembled a core group of experts um, across intellectual disciplines, ranging from epidemiology, cosmology, genetics, organizational behavior, climate modeling, and to today's speaker, uh, philosophy. Uh, today's speaker, I'm absolutely delighted to um, introduce him, uh, Professor Alex uh, Pizzo, who is um, a professor of uh, philosophy at Oxford. And it is a particular pleasure for me because he is also a very good friend. And um, so inference is a logical philosophical term that uh, Professor Pizzo will show us has been used to describe the process of deriving conclusions from premises. And the conclusion drawn from the premises is what we refer to as inference. In this talk, he will explore the mathematical and philosophical aspects of inference. And the word infer means to deduce or draw a conclusion from uh, the evidence that's provided. And it's the process of using logic to come up with a conclusion. There are two types of inferences, deductive and non-deductive inferences. So he will be delving into the two kinds of inferences and showing us the domain of validity of these two forms of inference. And in particular, he is going to be um, showing us that mathematics has a very long tradition of using formal reasoning, but some mathematicians have argued that there's a need for non-deductive reasoning in the field. So mathematics has always been considered an exact science, but um, in the last century, it is seen as more of an art with many different multiple approaches for problems. So in today's talk, Professor Pazu will present some of his ideas about non-deductive reasoning in mathematics and explain why, contrary to popular belief, it can be actually a source of knowledge as well as justified belief. But before I turn over the floor to him, uh, let me give you a formal introduction. Um, Alexander Puzo read mathematics, um, follow, followed by a year of philosophy part two at Trinity College, Cambridge. And after taking his BPhil in philosophy at Oxford, he returned to Cambridge for his PhD. He spent 2001 as a visiting graduate student at Princeton. After three years of a research fellowship at Jesus College, Cambridge, he moved to Oxford in 2005, where he's now a professor and a fellow of Wadham College. He has been an associate editor of the journal Mind and has held research fellowships from the Mind Association and the Lever Hume Trust, as well as visiting appointments at the Sydney Center for the Foundations of Science, King's College London, and the Institute d'Histoire de Philosophy, the Sciences and Techniques in, uh, in Paris. So um, as a uh, as is usual, we will have the colloquium today and tomorrow we will continue with a conversation 
with Professor Sher of the University of California, San Diego, uh, who will be um, talking to Alex and interacting with all of you in the uh, audience tomorrow at the same time. But uh, before um, I um, turn it over to um, Alex, uh, I just want to quickly uh, mention that uh, we have a virtual talk. This is upcoming uh, Frankie events. We have a virtual talk by the journalist Esther Honig um, on Wednesday, November 16th. And we have an in-person talk by the architect uh, and NASA engineer, James Ramsey on November 10th. And we will have our next Nature of Inference Colloquium talk uh, given by the computer scientist, Brian Cantwell-Smith. So without uh, further ado, Alex, the floor is yours and we are absolutely delighted to have you speak here today. Thank you very much, Priya, for that warm welcome. I'm extremely pleased to be here and to be able to discuss with you and share with a broader, broader audience uh, some ideas. It's been 20 years since we were part of a discussion group just out of grad school, uh, and it's very nice to sort of repeat that. I, I'd also like to thank the funders um, too. So uh, my topic today is inference from a logical and philosophical perspective. I work primarily in the philosophy of mathematics and logic, so that is effectively my perspective that I'll be um, describing. And I'll introduce the topic, give you some references, and then focus on two topics. First, the idea that logic is infinite, and secondly, on non-deductive inference reasoning in mathematics, and maybe speculate at the end on the link between the two. Um, so let's begin by distinguishing, as Priya already did, um, just to follow up on that, between logical and non-logical inference. So, um, what is the difference between the two? Well, let's have an example. The first um, inference that I want to mention is the following. All horses are ungulates. All ungulates are mammals. So all horses are mammals. Okay. Now, you, I hope, will recognize this to be a formal, a, a valid inference. That is to say, the conclusion follows from the premises. If the premises are true, then the conclusion um, also has to be true. And the interesting thing about this inference is it's, it instantiates a formal pattern, a formal schema. All A's are B's, all B's are C's, so all A's are C's. And you can see that any instance of that is valid. And in fact, in order to recognize the validity of the argument, you don't have to know what any of the um, adjectives there, mean, or any of the words like predic, horses, and ungulates, and mammals mean. I try this out regularly on my first year students. I ask them, uh, I show them this argument, and I ask them whether the premises make the conclusion true, or if the premises are true, does that mean that the conclusion has to be true? And they all recognize that the argument is valid. They all recognize that the truth of the premises necessitates the truth of the uh, conclusion, even though, and then I've asked them a follow-up question, even though most of them do not know what the word ungulate means. That just highlights, I think, the fact that we can recognize some of this argument to be valid just in virtue of the form, whatever the word ungulate means. The counterpart to logical inference is non-logical inference. So just to give us a simple example of this, um, previous samples have boiled at 100 degrees Celsius, so this one also will. So that's non-logical. The conclusion does not follow from the uh, premise, the single premise there necessarily, um, and it's not formal. The um, if you schematize it, if you turn it into um, formal letters, there you say previous A's have been a B's, so the next A will be a B. You can see that 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 can be a good inference in some cases, but will not um, invariably be a good inference. For example, if you've rolled. Um, a die a couple of times and it's been a six both times, then to infer that it will be a six the next time you throw it is, has a one in six chance of being true. So certainly not a, a valid argument. Okay, so that's the difference between logical and non-logical inference. How would we characterize logical inference? Many would define it as follows, necessary truth preservation in virtue of form. The con conclusion, um, follows necessarily from the premises in virtue of the form, as in the ungulates um, argument. 
and a mathematical proof, and I'm going to fo focus on mathematics later, so it's of particular interest to me, a mathematical proof is a logically valid argument from some axioms. And this is a fact that's come to be appreciated in the past 100, 120 years um, or so. That's to say, uh, the, you can turn any mathematical argument into a logical argument from the axioms of that particular area of mathematics, or perhaps more broadly, or the axioms of all of mathematics. And reasoning in science, in everyday life, and also in mathematics, um, has both logical and non-logical aspects. Sometimes we don't notice it in everyday life, uh, but we do use for, uh, logically valid arguments, and but we also um, often argue in a non-logical way. However, mathematics is somewhat exceptional in that there, a claim is regarded as established only if it has been proved. It's only a result if it's been proved. In other spheres of, um, of intellectual activity and other walks of life, you can establish a result, a claim, without proving it in a strict sense, but in mathematics, a claim is only regarded as, as really established if it's been proved, it becomes a theorem. So the, um, I, wanna to, so I wanna talk about both forms of validity and uh, my claim about logic and, and stake out two claims, um, one, one per form of validity. The claim about logical validity um, that I want to, examine is whether logic is finite. Okay. And this is actually a sort of a tenet of contemporary thought, or to put it sort of pejoratively, a dogma. And I will argue instead that uh, logical validity uh, can be infinite. What it means for logic to be finite or infinite, I will clarify uh, shortly. Um, the other sort of tenet about non -logical is about non-logical validity is, in mathematics at least, that this is sort of second rate. Um, the best form of argument is, as I mentioned, um, logical um, or deductive, you might say. But And in mathematics, anything that doesn't meet that standard, in some sense, doesn't cut the mustard. And so in particular, um, a non-logical inference cannot provide knowledge of a mathematical claim. Okay, so those are the two, um, the two theses I'm going to talk about and try to argue against, giving some reasons. Uh, for my views. I'm going to give you some references here on the, on the logical validity side of things. Um, this idea that logic is infinite that I'll be um, describing and defending. There are some pioneers in the field who, um, on whose work I'm building. Uh, the first is Alfred Tarski, um, who in a 1966 lecture that was posthumous, posthumously published in 1986, uh, first developed the idea that logic is infinite, um, to put it broadly speaking. And then there's Guy Lachère, uh, who I'm very pleased is with us uh, today and who will be my discussant tomorrow. Uh, and in her work, Building on Tarski, um, she uh, has also developed this idea ranging from uh, an early book, The Bounds of Logic in 91, to her most recent book, very recent in fact, um, Logical uh, Consequence. And my contribution to this um, debate this domain has been in most recently in the monograph um, One True Logic, co-written with Owen Griffiths, which came out a few months ago. That's on the logical validity side. And then the sort of references uh, on the, if you want to do some further reading on this, on the non-logical reasoning side of things, there's a classic, mid-20th century classics, classic by George Pollio called Mathematics and Plausible Reasoning. Um, and that was um, came out in the 50s and 60s. Uh, more recent and more philosophical engagement has been by Don Fallis in a couple of articles, and I've also cited one of mine uh, from 2015. Okay, so those are the references if anyone wants to do some follow-up reading. So let's move to the first big idea that logic is not as the sort of current thinking has it finite, but is in fact infinite. Okay, so the first thing we need to get clear on is what it means for logic to be finite um, or infinite. Okay, so a logic is in many ways like an ordinary language, right, such as pick your favorite ordinary language, natural language, ordinary language, um, English, Arabic, Spanish, Mandarin. Um, philosophers, by the way, as I already did, call these natural languages in distinction to um, logic. 
the language the language of, of, a, of a logic contains some vocabulary and it also contains rules for stringing together the vocabulary. We call that a grammar. That's true of a natural language that's just English as well. So two, let's give two examples of grammatical rules uh, for English. So if A and B are sentences, then their conjunction, A and B, is a sentence. So for example, if Fido is a dog, is a sentence, and Felix is a cat, is a sentence, then so is the sentence, Fido is a dog, and Felix is a cat. That's called the disjunction. And if A and B are sentences, then so is their disjunction. That's when you join them together by the word or. And to say that, that logic is finite, to put it very roughly, is to say that all the sentences are of finite length. But in contrast, an infinite logic allows you to conjoin, join with and or disjoin, join with or, infinitely many sentences, and to quantify over infinitely many variables. So you can say there exists not just one, one x, there exists x, there exists y, there exists z, but you can quantify over infinitely many variables. Okay, so, um, and I'll explain that a bit more as we go along. Infinite logics have been a minor area of mathematical study since the 1950s, but they're not generally regarded as correct, as capturing um, correct form of implication. The usual term here, by the way, in the field is finitary versus infinitary, but for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm going to just use uh, the simpler finite and infinite. So, um, the argument for the infinity of logic is, to my mind, made up of two sorts of considerations. There's what I call the bottom-up arguments, and these um, are re rest on relatively light theoretical principles. You don't need a great deal of theory um, or theoretical commitments to accept these. They sort of rest on things that most people believe about logic already, um, or slight extensions of, of them. The top-down arguments are much more theoretical. They're based on the nature of logic and or the logical constants. What are the logical constants? That won't be that relevant today, but um, they are, just to clarify that, they're expressions such as and or there exists. And those are dealt with, the two sorts of arguments are discussed in respective chapters of my recent monograph. Okay, so let's look at, at an argument. Um, the, can, let's consider this following argument. The, it consists of the premise, there's at least one planet. A second premise, there's at least, there are at least two planets. Third premise, there are at least three planets and so on for all finite numbers. So it has infinitely many premises and then it has a conclusion and that's drawn below um, the line. The conclusion is there are infinitely many planets. Okay, so if we think about that argument, this argument seems valid um, in some sense. That's to say the, the premises necessitate the conclusion, okay? If the premises, or put it another way, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Because if there's at least one planet, at least two, at least three, at least four, and so on, then there's got to be infinitely many. Okay. And the question is whether it's logically valid um, or not. Okay. So my claim, which I will not be able to defend here, but I will just state, is that this argument is in fact logically valid. One can show that it's logically valid, or one can argue that it is. The second claim is that standard logic, which is finite, cannot capture it. Okay, and this is actually quite an easy claim uh, to establish that the standard logic, um, which is first order logic, um, cannot capture this, this argument as logically valid. Because briefly, um, if in first order logic and standard logic, if there are, um, if there's an argument with infinitely many premises and a conclusion, it's a valid argument, there's also got to be an argu a sub argument made up of finitely many of those premises that entails the conclusion. And clearly, if you just have finitely many of those premises, you know that there are, say, two planets, at least two planets, at least 53, at least 412, up to some finite number, then it doesn't follow that there are infinitely many. The third claim is that other finite logics cannot capture this argument's generalizations. And the fourth claim is that an infinite logic can. So this is, a, this is what I call a bottom-up argument. Right? You, you, in order to capture the validity of this argument, assuming it is logically valid, and that's claim one, you need eff effectively what the, what the argument is, um, is that you need uh, infinite uh, logic. A finite logic isn't going to cut it. It's not going to be able to capture the validity of this argument. Let me give another example of a, um, another, another consideration on the sort of bottom-up side. Consider this argument here, and, and, and the reason I want to give another argument is to, to make it look a little bit less mathematical, less to do with numbers, 
Bob is not my parent. Bob is not my grandparent. Bob is not my great-grandparent, and so on. Okay? You keep on iterating the grades. Therefore, Bob is not my ancestor. Now, this argument is not formally valid if you change the word parent in all the premises, in, so in, in, in the word, in the first premise, turn it into, say, child, uh, turn the word parent in the second premise, the child to make it grandchild, and so on, then it, the, the conclusion will not follow. So it's not a formally valid argument. It's not just valid in virtue of form. But uh, if we add the meaning premise, um, we can make the argument formally valid. And the meaning premise here is the premise about the meaning of the word ancestor. And what's the relevant idea? Well, you're my ancestor if you are my parent or grandparent or great-grandparent or so on. Okay, so this is, an, uh, this is a list that continues ad infinitum. And if we add that uh, premise, then the argument becomes formally valid and can be captured in an infinite logic. So just to give you a sense of what an infinite logic looks like, the sentences of an infinite log logic look like, um, the formalization of this Bob argument plus the meaning premise would look like this. The first, the first premise would get formalized as not P1B, that's to be understood at, as Bob is not my parent, right? So the, the, first, the first symbol there is a not sign. P1 means is my parent, and B uh, can be understood as Bob, not Bob, the second premise, Bob is not my grand grandparent, and so on. And the meaning premise which we've added is that for all X, X is an ancestor, if and only if, that double arrow can be read as if, if and only if, um, some, it, that thing, that X, is either my parent or my grandparent or my great-grandparent and so on. And notice that that big V sign, it's a big disjunction, is infinite, right? You need to disjoin infinitely many um, formulas there. So that's the sense in which that formula, that, that, uh, that logic is infinite. And from that, the conclusion follows that Bob is not my ancestor. Okay, so so that was the so that's the um, these these are the sorts of uh, bottom up arguments that one can develop um, to uh, further to argue that logic should be infinite. Another sort of bottom up argument it consists of a sort of uh, um, Alex, I have a quick question. Yes. So this um, so that rests on the fact that you have an infinite layered set of relationships, right? Okay. You have an infinite premise premise set, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Actually, that's very relevant to something that I'll mention in in um, in a couple of, in a few slides. Thank you, Priya. Um, so the the thought experiment um, it imagines the following sort of being: a superhuman who can accomplish super tasks. Those are infinite. These are infinite tasks that can be completed in a finite amount of time. Okay. So a superhuman. Um, is capable of uttering an infinitely long sentence, such as the following, zero is even, and two is even, and four is even, and, and so on. So for every even number, the, uh, the, that, that claim that that number is even gets included in the sentence. How does a superhuman do it? Well, they utter zero is even in one second, then they speed up, they say, and two is even in half a second, they say, and four is even in a quarter of a second, and so on. So that after two seconds, they've uttered an infinitely long sentence, okay? Now, superhumans, uh, we do not think exist. Um, they're not biologically possible, perhaps. Um, they, perhaps they're physically possible, perhaps they're not. The important point here is that they're certainly conceptually possible. Um, there's nothing sort of conceptually wrong with assuming that they could exist, um, even if they don't actually exist. So suppose that superhumans perform the following sort of inference. They, they utter this infinitely long premise, and then they utter another uh, infinitely long sentence, again using speed up. But this one's a little different. They say zero is even, and four is even, and eight is even, and so on. So what they do in uttering the conclusion is they drop every other uh, clause in the uh, premise. They drop the two is even clause, and six is even clause, and 10 is even, and so on. And they just say the multiples of four. Okay, so I think, so this looks very much like um, a sort of inference that logicians think is completely fine in the finite case. You know, if you have A and B, and from that you infer that A, um, clearly that's completely fine and that's valid. Um, but in this case, there's a twist because we have an infinitely long uh, premise and an infinitely long conclusion. So it's an infinite form of what logicians call conjunction elimination. You, you, you have a conjunction and you eliminate some of the conjuncts. 
And this looks just as valid as a finite form of conjunction elimination. Okay. Um, and you might say in response to this, well, this inference is something that we can describe in finite terms. I've just done this in, the, in giving you the slide and talking about it, but actually we've got to imagine the superhumans actually carrying out um, the inference. Okay. We can come back to that in the questions if you like, but that's the sort of uh, that's a sort of thought experiment that is supposed to make more vivid the idea that log if logic, if finite logic is uh, a standard finite logic is logic, then why not go um, further and think that an infinite logic is also logic? Okay. Okay. So there are more bottom-up arguments than the above, uh, but it's time I think for a sort of important clarification. And here I must um, confess to something. I have to fess up to something. I labeled my uh, talk inference a logical philosophical perspective. But actually, in this part of the talk, I'm talking about implication rather than inference, uh, strictly speaking. And what is the difference? Implication is really a relation between sentences, okay? Something that holds um, uh, between some premises and a conclusion or premise set, if you like, and a conclusion. And it's a fact that holds between sentences and it's not anthropocentric. So in the ungulates argument, whether the premises entail the conclusion is not something that we do. Um, it's just a fact about those sentences. Inference, on the other hand, is something that an agent performs. Okay. And it is an anthropocentric notion because an, an, an agent reasons from premises to a conclusion. Um, even if we consider idealized agents, that's still a sort of anthropocentric uh, notion. Okay. Even if, for example, if we think about um, Bayesian epistemology, about Bayesian reasoners who are idealized in, in some sense, in some ways, that still is a form of inference. And logic's main role um, is, I think, I believe, to capture implication. It captures the relations between sentences. How does it relate to inference? Well, the study of inference and rationality is informed by logic, but it doesn't boil down to logic. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So suppose you, you believe A, some fact A, and you, and, you, and you ask yourself, what else should I think if I believe A? Well, then you might, you might come to appreciate the fact that A logically implies B, right? This is a fact about sentences that A implies B. But whether you then go on to believe B um, isn't determined entirely by the fact that A logically implies B. You may think that B, you may find B very implausible. You may think, hang on, I believed A. I now realize that A implies B, but B is very implausible. So maybe I should have another think about A. Maybe I should not believe A. Okay. So there may be all sorts of rational ways to, uh, to react to implication facts, and implication facts aren't going to determine um, all inferential facts. So implication is, uh, captures facts about sentences and inferences. Um, facts about what reasoners uh, do. Okay, so having said that, um, we can ask what language applied logicians or logicians who think about uh, using logic to capture reasonings as in the, uh, to capture um, our arguments couched in language such as the um, ungulates argument or the planets argument or the Bob argument um, I gave earlier, what language are we actually interested in here? here? So I've given these arguments in English, um, but actually the choice of a particular language such as English, for example, a natural language, even if you understand a language to include all the technical vocabulary, right? So when I say English, the examples I've given so far have mostly been sort of homely bits of um, vocabulary, you know, about planets, about, about horses and mammals, uh, about Bob being my ancestor or not, that sort of thing. But you can throw in all the sort of technical vocabulary of, of the sciences, of mathematics, of the law, um, and so on, so on. But the choice of any such language would be uh, as, as the sort of focus, the central focus of a logician's uh, study would be somewhat parochial. Why is that? Well, because natural languages sort of grow they accrue words by the day. Just to take an example, I can't play my DVD on my laptop. Well, that would have been incomprehensible to Victorians, okay? So it would be quite odd to give an account of logical implication that just applied to English as it is today on the 28th of September, 2022. That would seem too parochial, too narrow uh, a project. You want to 
you you really sh- the the logician should really be interested not in any particular na- natural language, including the technical parts as it is today, but it's in in its in extensions uh, as well. And once we appreciate this fact, that opens the door to generalizations of the bottom up arguments that go beyond the countably infinite. That's to say, that go beyond um, the infinity of the natural numbers zero, one, two, three, and so on. Okay, so that's so much for the bottom-up arguments. So they, that they strongly point to the conclusion that logic cannot be finite, but must be um, infinite. Now let's move on to the um, other, other type of argument for the infinity of logic, and this is a top-down argument about the nature of logic. So what is the nature of logic? Well, two features of logic that are generally uh, accepted are generality and topic neutrality. Generality is the idea that logic applies to all spheres, and topic ne- neutrality, a very closely related idea, is that it doesn't have a topic of its own, but rather it applies to all, all, all areas. So, for example, mathematics is about um, numbers and functions and um, shapes um, in geometry, and physics um, might study particles, economics, uh, rational it, economic behavior, be it of idealized agents or actual economies, and so on. These all have topics, but logic is topic neutral, is the idea. And the logician that I mentioned earlier, famous 20th century logician Tarski, he made this idea of topic neutrality precise by considering permutations. So if you look, consider the set ABC and a permutation mapping A to B, B to C, and C to A, think of that permutation, it's just shuffling the elements round. Well, some sets, such as the set ABC, is mapped to itself by this permutation. Okay, Some sets are mapped to themselves by the permutation. They're, they're invariant under it, because A gets mapped to B, B to C, C to A. But others are not. For example, AB is mapped to the, the other, a distinct set, B and C, because A gets mapped to B and C, B to C. So it's variant under the permutation. And if you think of properties and relations as sets and define what it is for a property or relation to be uh, permutation invariant, then uh, you can uh, get a notion applying to these of, of variance applying to these properties or relations. So for example, the property being American and the property being self-identical. If you think about all the, um, all the 8 billion, almost 8 billion people on the planet uh, today, a small subset of those are American. So if you permute the, uh, the 8 billion people um, on the planet today, and you map some Americans to some non-Americans, then the property, the set of the Americans uh, changes. Um, however, the property being self-identical is a property that's had by absolutely everyone on the planet. Okay, So however you permute the people on the planet, the set of people on the planet, um, that property is not going to change. It's going to be the set of all, all people. So that's that, and that that aligns with sort of intuitive judgments that being American is not a logical property, but being self-identical is a logical property. Uh, now, um, there's a there's a complication here because being human, for example, on the domain of all people alive today, as I said, the almost eight billion people, well, that will be permutation invariant as well because however you permute them, they're all human. So the set of uh, human beings over this uh, uh, is gonna stay uh, fixed over the uh, world's population. Um, but like being American, being human is not to- topic neutral. So Guy Lachet had the idea, um, the uh, correct idea that to remove all sensitivity to subject matter, we must consider not just permutations of a domain, but bijections to others of the same size. That's to say you map them to other sets of, of the same size. So you've got, you've got the almost 8 billion people, um, the domain of, all, of, of, of the uh, inhabitant, inhabitants of the planet today. You can map those almost 8 billion people to say the, the natural numbers. And then being human is not preserved under that, under that mapping. And the technical name for this, which I will not uh, use, but want you want to say, nonetheless, is isomorphism invariance. And a theorem proved by Van McGee links this notion of invariance to the infinity of logic. So roughly, a property or relation of the right type is invariant just when it's expressible by a formula of, and this is how this is pronounced, L infinity infinity. And this logic, L infinity infinity, is in a sense as infinite as can be. 
highly, highly infinite logic. So a more technical explanation would be to say that it extends standard logic by allowing for any, any, any cardinal, kappa, it's the Greek letter kappa, conjunctions and disjunctions of kappa many disjuncts, conjuncts or disjuncts respectively, and allowing quantification over kappa many argument places. Um, so for, to, to properly appreciate this, you have to know that there are lots of different sizes of infinity. And what this is saying is actually for whatever size of infinity you pick, um, you, the, the logic n infinity infinity is as large, at least as large as that. So just to, just to, uh, because this was somewhat more technical, this last idea, the, the sort of the top down argument, I want to summarize it. How does it start? It starts from the characterization of logic as being topic neutral, okay? And topic neutrality, and this is something that's generally agreed, topic neutrality can be more precisely understood as the notion of invariance that I described, okay? That's a more precise um, way of spelling out, and it's a, it's a precise way of spelling out this notion of topic neutrality. And it turns out that this notion of invariance co coincides with what can be characterized in a highly infinite logic. So the upshot is that we've got a top-down argument for the infinity of logic. If you ask, what is logic? The answer is, is topic neutral? You spell that out, and it turns out on that basis, you get an argument that logic is not just infinite, but highly infinite. And so these two sorts of arguments actually converge. They point to the same conclusion. The top-down and the bottom-up arguments point to the conclusion that logic is highly infinite, which in today's climate is quite a radical thought because up till uh, until fairly recently, I mean, until today, it's 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 almost universally logic is almost universally regarded as being um, finite. Okay, and yet um, I believe, as I uh, sketched, that there are good reasons to think that it's um, infinite, both top down about the nature of logic and bottom up about uh, which rest on uh, much less theoretical considerations about logic. Okay, so that was the logic side of things. And then the last third of the, the talk will be about non-deductive inference in mathematics. And here I will talk about uh, squarely about inference. And uh, this is the other side of, of the coin. The implication inference distinction that I mentioned earlier will not be uh, very important here. And usually when applied to mathematics, um, this may be called informal or non-deductive inference. Um, or reasoning. So I'll, I'll switch between those ways of speaking. Okay, so just to motivate this, let's think a little bit about this simple example. Suppose, let's say you're, you're a high school student and you're sort of playing around with the odd numbers, okay? And you notice a pattern, okay? You notice that one, well, of course, that's one squared. Then you add one plus three and one and three, and you get four, so two squared. One plus three plus five, you notice it's three squared. One plus three plus five plus seven is four squared. And this is news to you. You know, you're not a mathematical whiz. Um, you're a high, a high school student who's never encountered this before. And so you form the conjecture that the sum of the first n odd numbers is n squared. And then you might test quite a few more cases. Uh, you might test them by hand. Maybe you'll, you'll, you know some coding. So you'll program a computer to test the first billion cases. Um, and they all turn out to verify this conjecture. But do you know it? Do you know the conjecture even if you check the first billion cases? And I think the answer is a clear no, right? Um, you, what you have is some, some good but very partial um, evidence. And in particular, you lack a proof, right? Until you prove the, the, the claim, it's, not very, it's a very easy claim to prove, but we're assuming uh, the high school student has not uh, proved it at, at that point when they haven't proved it, just noticed the pattern, even for the first billion cases, they do not know uh, the claim. They haven't, uh, they lack a proof. Okay, now there are mathematically much more interesting examples where we have uh, more evidence and not just a little bit more evidence, but a lot more evidence. And the example I wanna give you um, is that of Goldbach's conjecture, um, call, it, call it GC, and it dates from 1742 in a letter by Christian Goldbach to Leonard Euler. It states that every even number greater than two is the sum of two primes. Okay, so here's an example, six is three plus three, and that's the only way you can write six as the sum of two primes, three is of course prime. Or you can write 100, uh, or to take 100, you can write that as 97 plus three. That's one way of doing it for 100. 
Another way would be 53 plus 47. And then there are lots of other ways. The interesting thing about Goldbach's conjecture, despite the fact that it was, that it was um, conjectured almost 300 years ago, it's currently unproved. But another interesting uh, fact about Goldbach's conjecture is that we have a lot, a lot of evidence for it. So let me just run through some of the evidence, not all of it. This is by no means an exhaustive list. The conjecture has been checked for every even number up to four times 10 to the 18, right? So a lot more than 10, um, than uh, a billion cases. Every sufficient, we also know, we, it's also been proved that every sufficiently large even number is the sum of two numbers. That, the first is a prime, and the second number is either a prime or the product of two primes. So that's getting very close to the conjecture, and that fact has been proved. It's also been proved, and this was actually in the 2010s, that every odd number is the sum of three primes. Again, very close to the uh, conjecture, slightly weaker claim. It's also been proved that every number is the sum of no more than six primes. Okay, the Gorbass conjecture, remember, says that it's, it's exactly two. I mean, you can do it with just two. So again, this is a weaker claim, but that's also been proved. We, it, we also know that the, in, for the cases that we know about, for the four time, up to the four times 10 to the 18 cases, um, not actually all of those, but quite a lot of those, number of ways that an even number can be written as a sum of two primes sort of non-monotonically increases. It doesn't increase in a sort of monotonic fashion, just going straight up, but you know, a bit like um, a currency sort of strengthening, sort of goes up and down a little bit, but with a kind of underlying um, growing trend. Um, so for example, in the case of six, uh, we saw that six can be written in just one way as a sum of two primes, three plus three, but a hundred can be written, we, we gave it at least two ways of doing it, and it can be written quite a few as a sum of two primes in quite a few ways. And in fact, when you get to some, a number even as small as about 10,000, that, that number can be written as, as the sum of two primes in hundreds of ways, which makes it very implausible that somehow this is going to sort of crash from, from being able to, to write a, a number as a sum of um, several hundred, uh, in, in several hundred ways as a sum of two primes, the next even number, somehow it's gonna crash and go down to, to zero. It's, it's, it's a plausibility argument, it's not a proof, but um, that is the thought. There's also a heuristic argument using the prime number theorem. And the prime number theorem tells you about the distribution of primes up to a particular uh, N, tells you roughly how many N, uh, numbers smaller than N um, are prime. And it also, uh, there's an argument based on it that strongly supports the idea that Goldbach's conjecture is true. It doesn't prove it. Um, it's, basic, it's based on how many numbers smaller than n are prime. And if you look at the, the sums of these numbers, of these prime numbers, well, according to this heuristic argument, every a typical integer that small or equal to, to n should be writable as the sum of two primes in sort of about n over two log n squared uh, ways. So in other words, uh, that should grow as n gets bigger and, uh, and bigger. And that's not a proof, but it's a, it's a heuristic argument from the sort of distribution of the primes. It's also been proved that the counterexamples, uh, the density ten, uh, tends to zero. That's to say, uh, at any given point, if you look at how many numbers um, up to that point might be counterexamples to the Goldbach conjecture, well, that, that ratio is going to definitely provably tend to zero. And there's, a, there's more evidence for Goldbach's conjecture. So as I say, lots of very strong evidence uh, for the truth of Gold, Goldbach's conjecture that does not add up to a proof and quite varied sort of evidence uh, too. Proofs of closely related results, numerical um, evidence, heuristic arguments, um, and so on. Um, and there are lots of other interesting um, conjectures in mathematics today. One is the probably the most famous unproved um, conjecture in unproved uh, statement in mathematics, the Riemann hypothesis. Um, you'd have to be more of an expert on that area of mathematics than I am uh, to cite um, the evidence uh, carefully there. Um, and there are other sorts of arguments uh, that are non-deductive in mathematics. For, uh, another well-known one is primality testing. For example, the Rabin-Miller test. And this, the way this test works is you put forward a number n, natural, a whole number n, 
And then you run a test on it to see whether it's prime. And you can do this um, several times. And every time you do it, the result is uh, the claim, the verdict of whether it's prime or not prime is independent of the previous one, if, if the number is prime. And so if you run the test a thousand times with different inputs, and a thousand times the test, the test says that n is prime, then it's provable, it's provably the case that n is prime with this probability, one, a probability at least one minus a quarter to a thousand. And that's just running the test a thousand, a thousand times. Of course, you can run it a lot more times and increase the uh, exponent there. Now, one minus a quarter to a thousand is extremely close to one, right? It's a degree of confidence in n's primality that, that outstrips almost everything um, any evidence that we have with respect to anything in ordinary life uh, and also in, in science. So we can be extremely, extremely confident that N is prime. It's not a proof that N is prime, but it's a proof that N is prime with extremely, extremely high probability. Okay. Um, so by all normal and even scientific standards, the evidence for uh, the Goldbach conjecture is extraordinarily strong. But most mathematicians nonetheless would say that we don't know Goldbach's conjecture. Um, even the ones who have all the evidence, that's to say number theorists who know um, this evidence about the conjecture. So I wanna suggest that actually they're wrong about this. That in some cases, and probably in the case of Gold, Goldbach's conjecture, and I'm gonna stick my neck out, um, we do know uh, the truth of the claim. And what, is the, what are the sorts of considerations um, we can run here? Well, in the interests of time, I'm just going to um, state them. I'm not going to uh, go into them in any detail. The first consideration is actually that deduction doesn't have any sort of special um, epistemological virtue. So people have thought that deduction preserves certainty. If you're certain of the premise, you should also be certain of the conclusion. So there's something special. Um, in that sense about deduction, but I don't think there's good reason to, to think that. Um, and just to run through the second, the others can, um, if, you, if you look at the sort of analyses of knowledge um, in philosophy and epistemology, they allow, they either allow for non-deductive uh, knowledge of mathematics, or they just do not apply to the case of mathematics. So general, general philosophers who are not particularly interested in the, in the philosophy of mathematics have come up with conditions on knowledge that don't seem to rule out non-deductive knowledge of mathematics, is the argument. Second consideration. And the third consideration that the axioms of the foundation are also justified, are often justified in terms of their consequences. So it would be a bit odd. Um, to justify some axioms of the foundation of mathematics, which is usually taken to be set theory, in terms of their consequences um, that are typically more like scientific sort of evidence, non-deductive evidence, um, but then insist that um, in order to know anything in mathematics, they must be provable from those axioms, which are justified in this sort of non-deductive uh, way. And a fourth sort of consideration is that there are strong links between the mathematical and the physical. You can know applied mathematical facts by observation and testing. You know, you might be able to know what the mean of a dis distribution is by, by sampling. Uh, you might be able to, you, you, you'd be able to um, work out some facts about geometrical facts by, uh, for example, doing experiments on physical uh, triangles. Um, you might know numerical facts by looking at um, clusters of, of physical objects and so on. And in those cases, I think we very clearly want to say that in the physical case, we, we know those facts, but then because they sort of are analogous to mathematical facts, it would be strange to say that we know the physical facts, they, cor they have corresponding mathematical facts, um, but yet we don't know those corresponding mathematical facts if we haven't proved them. Okay, so I realize I've run through those fairly quickly, but that's because I want to wrap up. Um, and, and just very briefly as my last slide, what is the link between the two things that I've talked about? Okay, so remember the first, my first uh, argument was that logic is infinite against the sort of tenet of contemporary thought that logic is finite. And the second one was that strictly about inference this time, that mathematical inference is not as bad as it, as it might seem. 
uh, and in fact can lead to, to knowledge. So maybe, I'm not entirely sure myself, but maybe what links them is a sort of permissiveness about inference and about implication. And, and my claims are that there's much more to logic than recognized. It's infinite, in fact, even highly infinite rather than finite. And that non-logical inference can be more reliable than is often appreciated. Um, and even in mathematics, where the deductive method reigns, it should be recognized as giving rise uh, to knowledge. So thank you very much. That's it. Great. Thank you so much, um, Alex. That was um, absolutely brilliant. Um, we can now open up the floor to questions. Are there um, any questions? Please go ahead and um, um, type in your questions. Um, I'll just give people a couple of minutes to um, get their bearings. So um, uh, if I may, uh, I may start. So what, what is special about the structure of mathematics? Obviously this is a big question, but there is something about, um, isn't there something about the structure of mathematics that there is an inherent provable self-consistency that you can demonstrate, right? Say compared to say physics. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I think I think what makes mathematics special is that it's so abstract. That it's about um, structure in general. So, for example, it might be about the structure of the natural numbers, or it might be the real numbers. But those can be described in very abstract terms, and they may have physical instantiations or not. Um, and that means because we can characterize them in this very abstract way, um, then we can use abstract arguments uh, to, to, to discuss them. And therefore makes the, the sort of deductive method possible because you're just looking at characterizing axioms. Right. And that's all it takes to understand the structure. And, and, um, and the structure and the sort of relationships between um, objects, mathematical objects, are somehow, they are more, um, they are not, they cannot be perturbed by experimentation, right? So the, the analog that you have in physics, that you, you have a system especially, you know, quantum mechanics is obviously the, the dramatic case where, you know, the act of making an observation alters the system itself, right? So there is something about the stability, right, of mathematical objects that permits you to make these logical arguments. Or uh, is there something about the fixity, right? So, um, Yeah, absolutely. So I don't, I think there isn't any sort of observer interference of any kind yeah. in the mathematical case. Um, and I mean, that's, so in the physical case, as, as you mentioned, that there is that famous instance. And, and of course, it's a major problem in social science um, that our role as theorists, uh, social scientists who are theorists are involved in the actual swirl of, of human life right. uh, and therefore can affect it. So there isn't that sort of feedback uh, in any way. And that maybe is one reason why that makes it sort of cleaner and easier to cleaner. study. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think uh, we have a question from Peter Morgan. What is the role of the axiom of choice in this kind of infinite logic? For the superhuman example, what difference does it make if the superhuman misses out a non-procedurally determined set of multiples of two. Ah, there's a gap, right? Thank, thank you very much, Peter Morgan. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so, so the example that I gave of the superhumans can be stated um, and fleshed out without using the axiom of choice. Um, because you can say it, you can specify the rule that I gave, the, the inference that I uh, mentioned, can be described 
quite simply, you're just missing out the multiples of two that are not multiples of four. Um, so you don't need the axiom of choice to, for that particular example. To answer the second part of your question, um, what difference would it make if the superhuman misses out a non-procedurally determined set of multiples of two? Yes, in that case, in order to, to imagine an inference of that sort, you might have to invoke the axiom of choice, um, depending on what, what is actually emitted. Um, but the, the, the idea doesn't rely on it. It does not rely on the axiom of choice because you can just describe it more simply in, in the way that I do. So the next question is from Kesavan, and is the claim here that the high degree of certainty is, or perhaps should be, sufficient for mathematical knowledge? Okay, Kesavan, yes, uh, thank you. Um, no, my answer to that is no. Um, I don't think high degree of certainty um, is enough. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true in, in any sphere. Um, it's, you need varied evidence, um, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't think it's easy to describe exactly what's required, but in, you need more than high degree of certainty. You need varied evidence, uh, so the evidence of different, of different types, and evidence that would convince, uh, that would, you know, that many experts would think would give you an extremely high uh, justification. So just to give an example of why high degree of certainty is not enough, um, in general, I mean, the, you know, they're the famous lottery cases described by, discussed by philosophers. You have a lottery ticket, uh, you think, you believe it's not going to win, there are maybe a million um, lottery tickets, and you know, you're, you're right, it's not, it, it doesn't win. Did you know it? Well, you didn't really know it, um, even if your degree of certainty was extremely high. So I, I want to say that high degree of certainty is very, can help, when, but, but it's not enough. You need to look at the quality. It's not just the sort of qual quantity, if you like, the quality of the evidence. But I do think that in some cases, for example, the case of the Goldbach conjecture, probably um, we do have that quality of evidence as well as the quantity. That's sufficient for knowledge. Thanks. <clears throat> so the next question is from Alexander Meehan. Thanks for a very clear talk. I'm curious to hear more about the connection between logic and inference and what the bridge principles are, if there are any. For example, I was wondering if you could take your arguments that logic is inf infinitary to show that deductive inference is infinitary and related, what would it mean to say that deductive inference is infinitary? Thank you, Alexander. Um, good, I mean, I think these are very difficult questions. Um, I, I, there are bridge principles, and it's actually an active area of research in, in philosophy, or epistemology more specifically, to work out what are the bridge principles between implication and inference between logic and um, rational inference. Um, but it's actually quite tricky uh, to spell them out precisely. So you might think it's something like, well, um, if you uh, believe the premises, then you ought to believe the um, uh, then you ought to believe the conclusion. So it will be something along those lines, but there's sort of devil in the detail there. Uh, and it's, 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 work out, it's hard to work out precisely what it is, but it's something along those lines. Um, as for the second part, deductive inf uh, inference is infinitary. I've sort of um, did not want to go that far because as I said, deductive inference is something agents do. And I find it hard. And, and yeah, you know, superhumans can carry out infinitary uh, reasoning, but we mere normal humans uh, cannot. And so if deductive inference is very much tied to what we can do, even somewhat idealized versions of us, then I'm not, I don't know if deductive inference is infinitary. I don't want to go that far. Um, that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. So the question is about the argument from topic neutrality. I see that to be able to characterize topic neutrality, we need to make use of higher infinities. But does this mean that our logic needs to incorporate these infinities? And another version of the same question maybe, is topic neutrality a neutral topic or is this special to the topic of logic? Is it tied, I guess, to logic? But... I see, okay, thank you, Mark. Um, right, so yes, yeah, so to, so, it's not so much that to characterize topic neutrality, 
we need to make use of higher infinities. It's more that when we spell out what topic neutrality means, what kind of expressions or what kind of relations and properties are topic neutral, they are the, they are the, they are the relations that can be expressed by an infinitary logic. So it comes by way of discovery. We're not using the higher infinities. They sort of come out of the argument. They tumble out of the, of the argument. Or another way of putting it, if you just think about these infinite conjunctions or disjunctions, um, they preserve the, con eliminating conjunction, infinitely many conjunctions, preserves topic neutrality. It's not specific. Uh, if you want a concrete example, it's not specific to any particular domain. So that's why that's how the argument goes from topic neutrality, infinite in, and highly infinite logic uh, falls out. Another version of the same question, maybe you asked, is topic neutrality a neutral topic um, or is it special to the topic of logic? OK, that's a tricky one. We've got some self uh, reflection going on there. Um, topic neutrality is a broad, I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that directly, but I'm not sure we need to. Topic neutrality is a feature, a characteristic of logic. It is special to the topic of um, logic. It doesn't apply, I suppose the answer is maybe straightforward. I guess maybe I'm now thinking, I now think it may be straightforward. It is special to the topic of logic. Other, other topics are, are not uh, topic neutral. You know, the law has a subject matter, uh, particle physics has a subject matter, microeconomics as a subject matter, and so on. But logic is, uh, seems like it's the only branch that has, um, that is topic um, neutral. Yeah, so then there's a question from Joel. Um, you distinguished implication from inference as apples and oranges, I think, but wasn't your first thesis about the first and your second about the second? Um, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> correct. My first thesis was about implication and my second one was about um, inference. Um, they are closely related. I, I, I want to be clear that they are distinct, but I also want to say that they are closely related. And as I fessed up, um, that my, I wanted to align this with, with the topic of this, of this, of this series. Uh, so I my snuck it into the title as, as inference. They are related, but but they are but nonetheless to, to get to, to be clear, they, they, they are distinct things. Um, are there any um, other questions? Actually, Gila, if you have a question, feel free to ask. And maybe I'll keep the question for next time, but maybe just one small thing uh, about topic neutrality. Um, it is very common in philosophy to say that a, 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 topic, a logic is topic neutral because it doesn't have a topic of its own. And, but I think that this is not accurate. Um, logic is topic neutral. In a to logic does have a topic of its own, and that is logical implication or logical inference. No other discipline studies this, and logic studies this. So that's definitely a distinct topic that logic has. But at the same time, what is right about that and why it's important that logic is topic neutral is that this topic, logical inference, applies to all fields of knowledge. And so it applies to all topics. It applies to all other topics. And that is because of certain very special features of logic that apply to all topics. So for example, physics does not apply to numbers, but logic applies both to numbers and to physical objects. So that's just a small uh, comment. Yeah, thanks for that uh, clarifying comment. So there is uh, one more question from Peter Morgan. So a differential equation can be a model for say an electrical circuit or a pendulum. Is that not topic neutral? Okay, um, thank you, Peter. So I, I would say that it's not exactly topic neutral. It's very general, mm -hmm. but it's not quite topic neutral. Um, to take the straightforward case, uh, maybe it's over the real numbers. 
Um, and so to differentiate um, a function over the real numbers, it's got to be you know, a differentiable function. So it has to have a, a, a pretty uh, specific kind of form. It, it doesn't, that, the, the, the equation just can't apply to any phenomenon uh, whatsoever. Uh, so it's very general, yes, but not quite as general uh, as logic. So that, 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 that was an um, interesting question to unpack this. Yeah, that was useful. Absolutely, Thanks, Alex. yes, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have another question from Alexander Meehan. So following up on a previous question, it wasn't obvious to me how evidence for the Goldbach conjecture differ, uh, differs um, nature from evidence for winning a lottery. Uh, I have a different intuitive reaction, but can you give me a more principled argument? It seemed to rely on diversity of kinds of evidence. Um, yes. Okay. So it's good. Um, so the look, if the evidence uh, for the okay, so the 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 evidence for the the diversity of kinds of evidence is is crucial. Um, I think, uh, and that is a big difference. Um, from the um, lottery uh, case to the lottery case. Um, and I think that's, that's a principle that we apply in all sorts of, uh, in all uh, spheres of reasoning, right? I mean, for example, the, you know, testing the boiling point of water. I mean, if you, however many times you test it, if you don't vary certain conditions, right? If you don't vary the pressure or the, the height, or we always do it in the same room, um, then uh, I don't think your evidence is as good as if you did it perhaps fewer times, but across a very different range uh, of con context and changing uh, other variables. Um, so I think it is very relevant uh, to have that you have all sorts of different types of evidence. Now, the thing that I also went over rather quickly, admittedly, uh, towards the end of the talk, was sort of more philosophical considerations for how you might convert this idea of uh, very strong and diverse types of evidence into just uh, an outright claim of knowledge. And, uh, and I think really the, the onus is on someone who, who doesn't think this to, to, to try and defend it. And the sorts of arguments I, I gave there were, you know, the kind of um, arguments that, that have come up in, in, in the kind of ideas that have come up in philosophy, for example, the nature of knowledge. Um, do you have what one sort of analysis of the nature of, of what knowledge is, is, a popular one, which is not exactly right, but a sort of right track is that it's a reliable, true belief, okay? So if you have a, a true belief um, about something and it's acquired by a reliable method, then that's knowledge. Now that's not quite right. We know that from decades of epistemology, but it's along the right lines. And the method for basing your mathematical, for, for for um, in, inferring Goldbach's goal conjecture on this sort of evidence is, I claim, is I think a reliable one. Um, and, and again, it's you know I think it's important that there are these heuristic arguments, right, about the nature of the primes, how many primes there are up to n, and it would just be there's no reason. And if you speak to a, to a mathematician, you know, and the mathematicians say there'd be no reason to expect it not to hold given the distribution of the primes. So there are. There are there are there are sort of inherent reasons here that go beyond just a lot of cases, just sheer quantity. There is uh, there are some follow up uh, questions. As another follow up question, I'll draw with that. Um, I might have a diversity of evidence that I won't win the lottery. I've done many lotteries before and lost. There are lots of tickets in this lottery. I'm generally an unlucky person, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems that the process of concluding based on this kind of evidence is a reliable one. Yes, okay, good. So the, the, the lottery cases show that it can't quite be reliability. There's gotta be, there's gotta be more to it than, than just reliability. But, but, but again, but the lottery cases, um, they're, sort of, they're sort of insensitive to, um, to whether you hold the winning ticket or not. I mean, you would still, even if you held the winning ticket, you would still believe that you weren't going to win the lottery, assuming you believe that you didn't win the lottery. Just to get the structure of the, the counter, the alleged counter example here, you're saying, well, in the lottery cases, uh, we don't want to say we have reliable true belief that we're not going to win, but the thought is we don't have knowledge. 
Um, that's correct, but it's, it's also insensitive to whether you um, have knowledge um, uh, to whether you hold a winning ticket or not. Because if you did by chance hold a winning ticket, you would still think the same things. But the mathematical case isn't like that. Um, if the um, if Gorbach's conjecture were false, and that's a very hard thing to, to, uh, to spell out, but we would expect quite different sorts of evidence is the idea. Right. So actually, I want to go back to um, this point that you made about um, the, uh, you know, our conception of the nature of knowledge and how reliable true belief. So if you, if you look at physics, right? So you are inherently, knowledge is inherently provisional. So are you making the claim that mathematical knowledge is, doesn't have that kind of provisionality? That it's reliable, I mean, that, that reliability is uppercase R somehow? No, in fact, I'm I'm very I'm very drawn hmm. to a more scientific picture of mathematical uh, knowledge, and in a, way, in a way, that's why I'm that's part of what's in the background here. Okay, yeah. That I think mathematics is is a bit more, at least a bit more, like science, natural science, than most people think. And of course, this sort of non-deductive reasoning is all over the place in science. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and so, and I think the history of mathematics show, uh, shows that mathematics, I mean, it's it's more cumulative than science, yeah. but it's not entirely cumulative. You know, there are revolutions in mathematics. Right. Um, there are things that we believe that everyone believed, you know, that all numbers were uh, positive or all numbers were real uh, for centuries or that, you know, the parallel postulate or... Um, you know, Euclid in one of his common notions says that the whole is bigger than its parts. Actually, set theory on one way of understanding that disproves that. So I, I, I do not, I, I don't have that picture of mathematics as sort of eternal in that in that way. So I mean, yeah, and that's uh, okay. Now that kind of fits. While uh, so that's why you're making a claim. So you're making the distinct uh, sort of distinguishing between sort of deductive and the non-deductive part of, okay, so you're kind of making room for a more provisional, um, yeah, okay. Absolutely, so I want to assimilate, I, I, I'm drawn, I, I, I'm trying to assimilate mathematics to science because that's what I think it, it is closer to science than we think. Okay. In its method. Okay. Any, um, are there any other questions? Um, I'll just give another minute if anyone has a last minute question. But um, thank you so much, Alex, that was fantastic. And thanks for patiently um, taking all these questions and clarifying. Um, I, I learned a lot and uh, it's very interesting to see that um, you are trying to construct a, a a view of knowledge and mathematics that actually aligns it much better with uh, sort of knowledge creation and knowledge in the sciences. And I, I wonder, um, you know, the sort of the, the next kind of um, uh, barrier, right, if you will, or the next uh, threshold to cross, right? So is, uh, you know, in scientific knowledge in physics and in many other disciplines, right, um, is experiential and experimental, right? So there is room for sort of empirical investigation. Do you see what is the portal that is opening up in mathematics that uh, takes you somewhere near there? Or is it a very different kind of provisionality that doesn't sort of go in that direction? Yeah, I mean, there is a field of mathematics, which is known as experimental um, mathematics. Um, and, and there it's, it, there's lots of things like probabilistic proofs um, and, you know, the kind of arguments that I, that I discussed. Um, so, I mean, it could be, it could be, I mean, one of the things, one of the things that you, uh, one of the types of evidence that I've just described is like inductive, what's known as inductive evidence, right? You just have more, you have a lot of A's that are B's and you infer that A's are B's. Um, so that's typical of science. But you also get another more subtle form of argument 
form, a more subtle uh, form of argument that happens in science, which is inference of the best explanation. You've got right. different phenomena, and then they you can find one explanation that covers them. And the classic example is Newton, um, Newton's theory of gravity unifying celestial and terrestrial mechanics, for example. Okay. Um, and I, I see that as also applying in mathematics. You've got disparate phenomena in different areas of, of mathematics, and then you can find a unifying theory that makes sense, sense of them. Uh, making sense in this way in mathematics will usually be implying them, right? right so right. you've got phenomena in area A, phenomena in area B, and then you find area C that somehow encompasses both and entails the results in area A and in an area B. Right. But it's the same sort of thing. Infra at, looked at through a general lens, it's 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 a it's something that allows you to uh, I make mean, sense. I think, of, yeah. yeah. I mean, I buy your argument uh, for the purposes of thinking about progress, right? So, what is progress? When are you accumulating new knowledge? So um, I see the, the analogy that you just gave works, aligns very well with physics, right? You often say that, you know, new, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity reduces to the Newtonian case, but it's a more general sort of, it's more sort of a larger covering theory, right? So the explanatory domain is much larger compared to sort of Newton's theory of gravitation, right? So I see that that is sort of what you are invoking, right? That there could be larger covering um, area C could sort of cover and encompass um, multiple existing domains. But would you, uh, but I mean, I guess uh, the question that begs the question, right? In physics, that would be progress. And I mean, that would be a measure of progress and of accumulation of new knowledge. Right. So does, is there the same notion of progress then built into uh, the accumulation of mathematical knowledge? I, I would argue that, yes. I mean, okay. in short, yeah. And, and this is one of the ways in which you, you get that progress um, takes place. Okay. Um, you find a larger area that encompasses areas that you knew about before. Um, I mean, an, an example from 19th century algebra is the development of group theory. Uh, which was, you know, Galois and the work of Galois uh, was really about finding solutions to um, polynomial equations. But then it turned out to have all sorts of applications outside um, that context. Okay. And so it, 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 there was a kind of general theory that of, about of groups that could develop, emerge, that, that could encompass lots of different phenomena in mathematics, not just, not just. Yeah, solutions of polynomials. Great. Um, so there's one final question before we let you go. Is deductive logic non-deductive? <laughs> <laughs> I um, some <laughs> circular <laughs> loops. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that, Joe. <laughs> I, I think I think deductive logic is deductive logic. It's 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 deductive. Is is what I'm going to say. I'm going to just I'm just going to. Uh, repeat it. <laughs> great. Okay, great. So if there are no further questions, uh, let's all thank Alex for a fantastic talk and a thought provoking talk. And we look forward tomorrow to the conversation um, between Alex and Gila. Thank you everyone for coming and see you tomorrow at the same time at 3 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much, Priya, and thanks to everyone for their questions. Yeah, thank you.